Okay, let us pray. Abba Yahuwah, I just want to thank you. I thank you for the Shabbat, my Father. I thank you for the many lessons that you are teaching us as we have embarked on this journey, as we are studying the book of Revelation. And Father, what a powerful chapter, chapter 6, in us being able to understand what it truly means to be able to be one that is to be a witness. What does it mean to be a witness? And as we have started last week and we looked at this opening of the fifth seal, what does it mean? What does it mean to be able to be one who is to be able to be a witness for you? Abba Yahuwah, I just want to thank you that we need to understand that we are living in a critical hour. And I have understood one thing. If we do not love your word and we do not love you above everything else in this world, we are going to battle with what is going to come. And we need to have the reality of an understanding that there will be many of us that might have to die because of what we stand for. And these things, unfortunately, are not being taught to us. They are not being shown to us. They're not being taught to us because nobody wants to speak about martyrdom. Nobody wants to speak about death. Everybody wants to speak about how we need to be able to be glorified and we're going to, you know, just prosper and 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 have health and prosper in everything. But nobody speaks about the fact that we need to be a witness for Messiah Yahushua. And so Abba Yahuwah, I just want to thank you that there is such a blessing for those that are willing to be able to lay down their lives for you. And we must understand that the times that are ahead of us, your word has said that if we try and save our lives, we will lose it. But if we lose our lives for your name's sake, we will save it. And so what kind of people should we aspire to be in the time and in the hour that we find ourselves in? Are we those that are trying to save our lives through all the things that this world is wanting to give us, where we have turned into so, we've turned to so many different alliances in our lives And how we see how sad it is that people are more and more turning to pharmacia as a source of life, to give them life. And what is more sad is when you ask people, did you ask the Father if you could do this? Because none of us seem to understand, or it seems to be a thing of where we have forgotten to understand that we are not our own. We have been bought with a price and we have a master, one who is over us, one who owns this piece of flesh, this piece of dust that we have come from the dust of the earth. And this piece of dust does not belong to ourselves. It was bought with a price and there is a master that is in charge of this piece of land and he's the land lord he's the he's the lord that is over this piece of ground and therefore we don't just do what we like go where we where we like and do what we like we have been bought with a price and this body belongs to him and if we could become more mindful of that I think it would be a lot easier for us to be able to live in this life if we could just learn to turn to you for everything as opposed to wanting to pray everything away rather ask you what are you wanting to show us through what we're going through such a different way just a different way to pray but we've been so conditioned to the minute there's something, let's pray it away. We don't want to suffer. We don't want to go through anything. We have been taught a a Christianity that has taught us that we are not to suffer, that we're not to go through anything, that we are supposed to prosper, that we are supposed to be um, blessed. But part of being blessed has really to do with we are in the fullness of the Father, walking with him 
hearing his voice, being led by him. Being blessed is to be able to have his word, the wisdom of his word being opened up to us so that we may understand the depths and the riches that comes from this word. The richness that is in your word, the nuggets of gold that you want to open up to us to reveal the deeper revelation of your heart. And so today, Father, I pray that you would open up the mind of our understanding. Open up our hearts, Abba. Open us up to a place of where we truly may be able to come and be led by you and be taught by you. Father, I am just a mouthpiece. And so I pray that you will speak to my mind and speak to my heart the very oracles that will come from you so that we may be those that may have ears to hear, <clears throat> eyes to see, and a heart open to receive. I thank you, Abba Yahuwah, that this is not a message. That is just a message that's to be able to be preached so that we can come to the end of it and say, oh, wow, that was a powerful message. Abba Yahuwah, I pray that this is a message that we may understand to be able to want to walk out in our lives, to put what you speak in your word into practice, to be mindful of what is ahead of us, Father. And so I praise and I thank you that I can commit this time to you right now, knowing that you are the one that has gone before us and that you are the one that is going to reveal your scriptures to us. In Yahushua's name, I pray this. Amen. Praise Abba Yahuwah. And so last week, we started looking at, we really just um, laid a foundation of where we are in Revelation chapter 6, where we looked at the fifth seal and we really had a look at the deeper revelation of what this number five stands for. And who are these people? Because we've gone into the, you know, the, the very first um, from chapter, uh, chapter six from verses one to verse eight is really the four horses of the book of revelation that has been the seals that have been opened and these horses are riding. But you see, there is a pattern, there is a pattern, and we saw this pattern unfold for us in Matthew chapter 24, where Yeshua lays out the pattern very nicely, and he shows you how, where he says, let no one deceive you, that there will be many false prophets, and many, though, many of those that will say that they are the Messiah, and they come in the name of the Messiah, but this is the falsehood, and there is the false a peace that's going to come and this falseness of this religious system that looks so pious and looks so good and looks so holy and looks so peaceful but yet at the end of the day it's bringing us more and more into destruction and this is really like a white horse and then we've had a look at the red horse and we've had a look at the black horse and then we had a look at the pale horse where it's just death and destruction famine and the sword and death and pestilence and disease that is going to come with these four horses that are riding. But then there is this fifth seal. And in this fifth seal, we saw that it is talking about, I saw under the slaughter place, the beings of those having been slain for the word of Elua and for the witness of which they helped. And so we had a look and we saw that a slaughter place, these beings are at the bottom of a slaughter place. And so this is the slaughter place of the sacrifice in the temple or in the tabernacle. And so yeah, we are and we're having a look at, we had a look, we just... Um, we in this place we have a look and we see that um, we have a look at we had a look at Leviticus chapter four. So let's go to Leviticus chapter four, and we have a look at Leviticus chapter four. We had a look at it, and today we're going to go a little bit more into detail. Where we had a look and we saw that in Leviticus chapter four it says, "And the anointed priests shall take some of the bull's blood 
And so we're looking at Leviticus chapter 4 from verses 5, and it says, They'll bring to the tent of appointment, and the priest shall dip his finger in the blood and sprinkle some of the blood seven times before Yahuwah in front of the veil of the set-apart place. And the priest shall put some of the blood on the horns of the slaughter place of sweet incense before Yahuwah, which is in the tent of appointment, and pour all the blood of the bulls at the base of the slaughter place of the ascending offering, which is at the door of the tent of appointment. And where are they? They are sitting. Have a look and see. Let's read it again. They are really there. By these beings, I saw under the slaughter place the beings of those having been slain. So they're sitting directly under the slaughter place. And the slaughter place is the altar of slaughter where they would slaughter the animals as the sin offerings, as the peace offerings, as these offerings that were being done to the Father. And this was part of the ascending offerings. And this is the slaughter place where you would have to come. So if we really look at the slaughter place, when it comes to um, the tabernacle, it's the very first um, very first uh, bit of uh, um, furniture that you get when you enter into a, the, the, the tabernacle. In the wilderness. And so you go through a door. Who is the door? Messiah Yahushua is the door. We go through the door of the tent of appointment. The tent of the, the, the tabernacle. We go through the door of the outer court. And so the outer court has got this this whole. Um, uh, um, like a screen around it in white. With these white. It was all in white material all around which formed a screen around where eventually you're going to have the tabernacle there where his presence is going to dwell so you first have to enter through the door of the outer court that makes up the outer court of where the tent of appointment is and Yeshua is the door because he says I am the way so he is the door that we enter through when we come into the tent of in, where we're going to enter into the place of where the tabernacle dwells. And the very first piece of furniture that you get is this slaughter place, this brazen altar. This is an altar and it is a sort of slaughter place. And this is where you come and bring your sacrifice for your sin. And if we really go into detail, which I have taught extensively on the tabernacle, as I did a whole conference explaining the tabernacle, um, that very altar is basically the very first place where Yoshua, it's basically where Yoshua, he comes and he laid down his life for us to deliver us from our sin. So he was the ultimate sacrifice. So there's no more sacrifices being necessary to be given for sin because he became the ultimate sacrifice that laid down his life for us. And so he came and he laid down his life for us. And so we now, when we come to and we enter because you see the tabernacle as an outer court. It's got a holy place. It's got the holy of holies. And so this is the pattern that we must go through in order to understand for us to be able to come into that place of the presence of the Father. Just like everybody was allowed to go into the outer court. The, Isra the Israelites were all allowed to go into the outer court in order to be able to bring their sacrifice. But only the priests were allowed to be able to go from there further, to go to the brazen laver. And from the brazen laver then to be able to enter into the, into the tabernacle, into the 
holy place, which is where you've got the menorah, the table of showbread, the altar of incense, and then only the high priest was allowed to go into the holy of holies. And so this is a whole thing of understanding. But you see, Yeshua became our witness. He became the ultimate sacrifice that lay himself down, that gave himself on a, at the stake. He was crucified at the stake and lay his life down for us so that we no longer need to go and sacrifice animals for the remission of sins. And this is the problem that we find with the Jewish people because what sacrifices do they have? So they're always looking to see that they can still do sacrifices and this is why they want their temple to be rebuilt. To be able to have a red heifer. To be able to come and atone for the sins. But we have Messiah Yahushua. So when we enter into the process, the very first place that we come to is a brazen altar. A slaughter place. For us to understand, as our Messiah lay his life down, are we willing to lay our lives down? You see, this is the problem. The problem is we get saved and then we think that, okay, now I'm saved. He's there to serve me. No, no, no. You get saved and then you come to a brazen altar where you need to lay down your life to the one who's already paid the price for you. So this is the one who's gone before you. This is the one who paid the price for you. And as he laid down his life, so are we called to lay down our lives for him. But you see, that is not the mindset. The mindset that we've been taught is that we are now saved so that now he's there to answer my prayer. He's there to do everything for me. But lo and behold, let me not do anything for him. It's not about me having to lay my life down for him. He laid his life down for me, but I don't want to lay down my life for him. So many people are still the master of their own lives. They are still seated on a throne. Now you must understand, there is only one ruler, one master, one king. And he is the king of your life. And we are servants in this kingdom. And that is why we don't understand martyrdom. We don't understand martyrdom because we still love our lives. And we have not understood that we were bought with a price. And because we were bought with a price, we are not our own. And therefore, we are no servant is greater than his master. Which means if he laid down his life for us, then why can we not lay down our lives for him? But you see, this is not the mindset of what we've been taught in the religious systems that we've had. Because nowhere in the religious systems that we have come into do are we taught that we're actually supposed to crucify ourselves. We are supposed to die daily with Messiah. We are supposed to crucify our lives on a daily basis to say, not my will, but your will be done. Because why? We have a flesh evil nature that wants to rule. And understand, if your flesh nature rules, who is on the throne? None other than Hasatan himself who is on the throne. And that is why this is a priesthood. And the priesthood were the ones that were the ones that came to give the blood on the altar. It says they came to sprinkle the blood. It says, and the priest shall dip his finger in the blood and sprinkle some of the blood seven times before Yahuwah in front of the veil of the set apart place. And the priest shall put some of the blood on the horns of the slaughter place for sweet incense before Yahuwah. So you see, Abba Yahuwah is going to have a priesthood. 
that is going to raise up, that is going to be able to be those that will be willing to give their blood, give their lives, lay down their lives, surrender their lives for him because they love him more than they love themselves. They love him. You see, what are the two greatest commands that was given? Love Abba Yahuwah with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul. And love your neighbor as you love yourself. So you might be required to give your life for a neighbor. You might be required, if you love me, Yeshua said, if you love me, you will obey my commands. No greater love is there than for one to lay down his life for another. So he might require you to lay down your life for someone else. He might require you to lay down your life most assuredly for him. Because he's the one who paid the price for you. And you see, this is the mindset that we need to have. Now the only time that I really use the word Lord. Because I don't like the word Lord. Because we understand that Lord, when we translate it, Lord means Baal. But you see, the only time I will use it is when I say landlord. Because it's the landlord, it's the landlord that owns the piece of land. So you were bought with a price. And what was purchased was a piece of land. Because what are you, where were you created? You were created from the dust of the earth. So therefore you are a garden. You are a piece of land. And you were, cre you were bought with a price. And that piece of land was bought. And you have a master. You have a landlord that you are responsible to bow down to. So when you are renting a place. Like yeah. Where my husband is staying. This is a rented place. We can't just decide to break down and build and do whatever we like. We can't just go about and do whatever we like. We have to ask permission from the landlord. Okay, I want to be able to um, build something here, or I want to break this down here, or I want to put this up there, or I want to put this petition here, <coughs> because the place is not yours. They bought it. They own the title deed. I tell you something. You are not your own. Your title deed belongs to the one who purchased you. And that was Messiah Yahushua. He paid the price. And he owns the title deed. So you belong to other father because Yahushua came to make the way. So that you may be returned back to the father. Do you understand? Which means you don't have any right of your life. I remember the one time when I sat and I said, I have the right to be happy. And this was at a time in my life when I was seriously contemplating to divorce my husband because things were not going well. And there were many things going on in my life. And I came to a place of where I thought, I don't need to put up with this. I have the right to be happy. And then I'm sharing this with Elsie and she says, no, you tend to forget you have no rights. You were bought with a price. You don't belong to yourself. You don't make that decision. So before you get excited in what you want to do, you better be asking the father, what does he want? That was not what I wanted to hear. Because you see, this is the way we behave in our lives. I want to do, I want to have, I want to go, and I do what I want. And this is what is teaching me through Isaiah. Every time they did their own thing, this is what he was coming up against them about, was because they put alliances in everything other than him. So he's the one who has given them life. He's the one that has, he's the one that, that they are, so that they're coming to the temple to worship. They're doing all of this. But yet at the end of the day, they still want to rule their own lives. They don't trust him for anything. They don't put their faith in him. They don't trust him. And they still do what they want. 
And it's interesting because every person that I ask, that I say, I want to ask you, did you ask the father if you could go and take a, a injection in your arm? Did you ask him if you were allowed to do that because your body doesn't belong to you? And they look at me like, weird, what's wrong with you? What are you talking about? <laughs> Why would I do something like that? Well, if you're going to put something into a body that doesn't belong to you, the one who dwells within you is the one who owns the body. Don't you think he's got a right to be asked before you do something? Now, I ask you today, how many times have we even asked him before we do anything to this body? But people want to tattoo it. People want to um, cut it open. They want to put all kinds of things into it and do a bunch of things with it and we don't need to worry about anything. We will treat it as what we want it, but yet it doesn't belong to us. We want to eat whatever we want. We want to do whatever we want. And yet at the end of the day, it doesn't belong to us. So that's why I say he is the landlord of your piece of flesh. And that is why this I have to lay down. Father is bringing this this morning to understand. You can't just speak about martyrdom and being martyred without understanding that you cannot love your life. If you still love your life and you're still the master of your own life and you still rule your own life and you still sit on the throne of your own life, you will not give your life for him. You will be eluded. You will bow down to a beast system. Because at the end of the day, you will bow down to that which you love. And that was the message that the father gave me in this week when he gave me a prophetic word. And he said to me, he said to me, I hand each one over to the desire of that which they love. That which they desire. If they desire this, I will hand them over to that desire. So whatever they desire more than me. Even in the things of the Father, do you know that people can actually love the things of the Father more than they actually love Him? And that's what He said to me. So if you love to be in the heavenly realm and you want to seek the courts of heaven and you want to keep going into the courts of heaven and do all these things in the courts of heaven, you seek that more than you actually seek to be just still with Him and spend time with Him and just be quiet with Him because you want to be dwelling in that place. And like he said to me, I give them over to what they desire. And if that is what they want, it will become their downfall in the end. And then there's people that love knowledge. And so they only read the word to get more knowledge and more knowledge and more knowledge of the word. But they're not really willing to want to put it into practice. They just want to be able to know that they know this word. Like you'll get the, 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 the Jews that will spend most of your Orthodox Jews that go to, to a yeshiva and everything. They will spend between 14 and 16 hours a day studying. But they're not studying the word as such. They study part of, they study part of the Torah and everything, but they study the Zohar and the Mishnah and the, and the, and the Talmud and they study hours and hours to be able to just puff themselves up with so much knowledge. And he says, if that is what you desire, I will give it to you. But it will become your downfall in the end. And so we must understand that the Father is now having to take us to understand martyrdom is one who truly follows and loves him above everything else. They love his word and they love him. They love his word because why? They love his word because they're willing to walk out his word. They don't just they don't just hear the word. They are not hearers of the word. They are doers of the word. They hear the word. They allow the word to come into their heart. They allow the word to convict it. They allow the word. They they the word is their life. They want to live the word. Because they know that he is the word. It's not just people that want to just read the word so that they can just, you know, increase their knowledge of the word. There's a huge difference. And so the father is really taking us deeper to understand the sacrifice. To understand that this blood, this is the blood of those that were willing to be martyred for their faith. 
And they are sitting at the bottom of the slaughter place. So what is that slaughter place? It's the slaughter place of where Yeshua himself was willing to be crucified as the ultimate lamb that was slain for us. So these are a people that are going to die as martyrs that are going to be able to give their blood for him. For what they stand for. And this is a priesthood of a people. So you must understand, these are his priests who are in the face, in the face of warfare, in the face of famine, in the face of persecution, in the face of death. They will be called to stand firmly for what they believe. They are those that will endure to the end, even if it means death. Why? Because what is their passion? You see, that is what I say. You will serve the thing that you have the passion for. So what is the passion that is there? Because whatever your passion is, that is what will drive you. So if people are passionate, whatever it is that becomes their passion, that's the thing that drives them. So there's people that are passionate about work. So their work will drive them because that's where they find the source of everything, of the passion, the thing that gives them passion. That is the thing that will drive them. So what is your passion? Because if your passion is not Abba Yahuwah, then something else is going to drive you. And this is what we must understand. So let's go look at Matthew chapter 10. So we looked already yesterday, last week, we looked at Matthew chapter 24. We looked at the fact that we're going to be persecuted, we're going to be afflicted. We've had a look now that this is those that are having to be slain. So before we go to um, um, Matthew chapter 10, I just want to read again. So it says, and he will open the fifth seal. And I saw under the slaughter place the beings of those having been slain. Okay, so we are going to look at this slain. But we're first going to see what what is it that we're going to have to go through? So we've looked at Matthew chapter 24. Let's quickly go to Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10 from verses 16 and it says... See, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. So you must understand, we that are his witnesses, because understand, everything that we're going to understand about this fifth seal that has been opened, this fifth seal of these people that have been slain for their faith, slain for the word of Yahuwah, slain for the witness. These are those that must, we've got to understand what is it that we're going to have to go through? What is it that we have to endure? What is the makeup of these people? What is what, what are they about? So we look and we see. See, I send you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. So we are the sheep that are in the midst of wolves. So we got wolves around us. Therefore, be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. And I want you to understand something. We have wolves... That will be amongst us that come in sheep's clothes. So amongst us, we will have wool. They are wolves, but they come to you in sheep's clothes. Because instead of them getting you to be able to draw closer to the Father and get you to be able to help you in your sinful way to draw closer to the Father. They excuse this, your sin and help you to continue in your sin as opposed to help you to stop your sin. And this is what we must, this is the thing that the Father was revealing to me this morning because this is the very thing that this 
prophet friend of mine was discussing with me this morning when she said, I don't understand. Instead of us being able to get people out of the sin, we start making excuses and we help them in their sin. We need to call it out for what it is. But you see, the first thing that someone says, don't judge. So this is where we are right now. So we are living amongst those that will continue in their sinful way because nobody wants to speak against the sinful things. Because we don't want to speak up. We rather just keep quiet about it. So he says, but beware of men. For they shall deliver you up to Sanhedrins and flog you in their congregation. So understand, there are going to be those that are going to flog you. They're going to, 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 to be the ones that are going to be able to deliver you up to the Sanhedrin. So understand, this Sanhedrin council is coming again. And they are going to be part of like this, this uh, Noahide laws that are coming. And they are wanting to control the world. And you are going to have to conform to a, to a religious, um, uh, uh, um, a one religious system. Let's put it that way because I, I don't want to use those other words because they check these words that we use. So uh, coming under a banner of everybody having to worship under one banner, do you understand? Where we're all going to have to follow the same way, where everybody's following the same way. And you shall be brought before governors and, for, and sovereigns for my sake. As a witness. Make a note of that because this is about witness. For them, to them and to the nation. So you see, you are going to have to be a witness. You see, what, this is what we must understand. You know why sometimes sinful people do not want you around? You know, have you ever thought... <laughs> You know, when you got saved, and for example, say now you get saved, and now you no longer, you, you, you know, you make a decision. I mean, these days it seems to be very different, but you know, when I got saved, it was a case of where you no longer do what the world did. So, so you know, I, I no longer smoked with them. I no longer drank with them because, I, I you know, the, immediately the father stopped me drinking. He stopped me smoking. So now they don't want you around. Why? Because you are a witness to them of your walking set-apartness before the Father. <laughs> and they don't want you there. And then they start to persecute you. But why do they persecute you? They persecute you because your sin, no, their sin, your righteousness is in their face and their sin is before them. And they don't want their sin to be exposed. So you see, the minute you stand with them, and you say, no, sorry, I don't do that. Or sorry, I don't do this. And now you dress differently. You act differently. You, you speak differently. You're not like them. They, they will persecute you. Why do they persecute you? Because your right standing for the Father, your set-apart holy walk for the Father, is exposing their sinful way. And therefore, you are a witness to them of Messiah's way. And therefore, they persecute you. This is the revelation that the Father has given me to understand. You see, that is why they, they start to be nasty to you and start to persecute you. Why? It's because their own sinful nature. The more they are in their sin, the more guilty they feel in having you around. That's why they want you to be able to do what they do. Because if you do what they do, then therefore they don't have to stop their sin. They can continue in their sinful way. Do you understand? Do you see how the enemy works? So, swit suk swit. So let me stay with that one. It's like like, um, like follows like. Why? Because we can all be together in the same sinful way. But the minute you come up against the grid and you start to stand for what is right, then they will come against you because now they don't like your stand and they don't want their sin to be exposed. 
So it says, But when they deliver you up, do not worry about how or what you should speak, for it shall be given to you in that hour what you shall speak. So understand, at that moment, Father will put the words in your mouth that you are to speak. He is going to lead you to speak a word. Like I said, this was not even a topic. Last week, I was in such a place that I didn't even want to do this message. And now the Father is just expounding and expounding. Why? Because I humbled myself and I said, Father, I've got nothing to say to your people about this subject. And this will be a subject that he's most probably going to land up doing three sessions with. From the place where I came before him and said, I've got nothing to say to your people. Do you understand? This is why I'm saying, Father will put the words in your mouth that you ought to speak because he knows what he wants to say to his people. He knows what you need to speak to those people at that time. For it is not you who speak. You see, it is not me that speaks. Most of the time it's not me. All of a sudden I start going on a tangent to some place and I say, what the heck, I wasn't going there. It's not me that's in control. He'll put the words in my mouth and I'm to speak because he knows what the people need to hear. But the spirit of Yahuwah is speaking in you. And brother, now listen carefully, and brother shall deliver a brother to death and father his child and children shall rise against parents and shall put them to death. And so understand, those of your own household will become your enemy. Brother will turn against brother, mother against daughter, son against father even i will even go one step further to say husband against wife because i know i know what that's like for 17 years i know what it's like to have been in a place where the more i'm trying to walk set apart for the father the more my husband's going in another direction and the more war there was in my house and so it was a difficult process it's a very difficult process but it's like I explained. Why? Because you are standing for what is right and they don't understand. And therefore, they will want to crucify you thinking that they are doing the, whatever the, the, the council is going to be at the time a favor. Because you are rebellious. Because you're going to stand for what is right. And you shall be hated. Now listen, hate is a strong word. Hate is a very, very strong word. And you shall be hated by all for my name's sake. But you who shall have endured to the end shall be saved. So imagine, you shall be hated. Hate is a strong word. Remember, when Cain allowed jealousy into his heart, from the jealousy what happened? Hate. And what came out of hate? He murdered his brother. So when they hate you, what do they want to do? They will want to kill you. Because that's what's going to come with hate. And so those who endure to the end shall be saved. So what is the endurance? Let's look at the word endure. The word endure is the word hupomeno, which is G5278. Hupomeno. And what does this mean? It means to remain, to tarry, to preserve under misfortunes and trials, to hold fast to one's faith in Messiah, to endure, to bear bravely, and to calmly ill and to bear bravely and calmly ill treatments, to stay un, to stay under, to remain and undergo. That is to bear trials, to persevere suffering. So understand, that is the one that's going to have to endure. The one who's going to endure all these things. They're going to have to go through these hardships. They're going to have to go through these trials. They're going to go through these persecutions. They're going to want to be killed. 
that one is the one that will be saved. Remember, if you're going to lose your life, you will save it. But if you want to save your life, you will lose it. So your enduring might be part of dying. Remember, how much did the disciples have to endure? How much did Paul have to endure before eventually he was killed? How much did the other disciples have to endure persecution and, and trials and being put in jail and, you know, all these things that they had to go through until eventually being scorched, being whipped, until eventually they were put to death. So there's an endurance that will have to happen until such time that maybe we're going to have to be put to death. And when they persecute you in this city, flee to another. For truly I say to you, you shall by no means have gone through the, the cities of Israel before the son of your Adam comes. A taught one, there we go. Now listen carefully. A taught one is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. So this is what we've had to understand. If Yeshua came to that brazen altar, he came, if he came to that slaughter altar and he laid down his life at Passover, that's the very first feast. So the very first item that you get has everything to do with the Passover. Where he came and he laid down his life. He was crucified. He was impaled. For us. Not so that it means to say that we now are going to go through nothing. And this is the, the error that has been given to us in the church. Oh, he has suffered everything so that I don't need to suffer anything. Oh, what a cop-out lie. He has suffered and gone through everything and endured everything so that you have no excuse now because he gives you the strength to endure and overcome and die as he had to. But you see, these are the lies that we've been taught. So he says, no taught one. So if you are truly his disciple, he says, you need, he says if you are my disciple, you need to follow me. What do you need to do? You need to pick up your stake, pick up your cross. You need to deny yourself, meaning self is not on a throne. And you need to follow me, which means I am the master. I am the one that is going to lead you on the path that you are to go. You are not your own. You've been bought with a price. You are a piece of land. And that piece of land has to, it's owned by the one who has the title deed and he has the title deed of that land and you are just you are responsible to take care of that piece of land that is his you're not allowed to do with it what you like you are responsible for that piece of land you are you have to give an account do you do you understand when you come to the end of your life you are going to give an account of what you did with the piece of land that he entrusted to you. Because he bought it. And now you are to, responsible to take care of it. What have you done with it? What have we done with the piece of land that he's got the title deed for? And so he says. It is enough. It is enough for the taught one to become like his teacher. And his servant like his master. If they called the master of the house Beelzebub, how much more those of his household? So understand, if they called him that they said he was casting out demons by the spirit of, the, of Beelzebub, of the devil himself, do you think they're not going to call you names? Do you think they're not going to stand up against you? Do you think they're not going to persecute you? Do you think they're not going to say, oh, you know what, you, 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 are, you think you're holier than thou, and you know, these are the things that, that get told you. And Look at the way you carry on and now you like this and now you, and then they speak things against you and oh, now you know you, you think you like this and, and then people just persecute you. They persecute you. But did they not do it to him? But you see, this is the thing that we start to have to get conditioned with. 
Because these things are going to come. Your friends are going to turn against you. Your family is going to turn against you. Your own household people are going to start to turn against you. Why? Because if you are going to want to walk more righteous before the Father, they don't want to walk righteous before the Father. So they will persecute you that want to walk righteous before the Father. Because that's the way it's going to be. Until eventually they will hand you over. Because they don't want you to be able to become like the one that you are following. So they were going to kill them. Because now they were becoming like your sure on the earth. Now there's not one that they've got to worry with about. They're worrying about how many thousands of them. So let's put a stop to it. Therefore, do not fear them. For whatever is covered shall be revealed and whatever is hidden shall be made known. What I say to you in the dark, speak in the light. So do you see? No, the, what is done in the darkness, people want to hide in the dark because they sin in the dark and they want to hide in the dark. And nobody wants to bring their sin into the light. But what does Yeshua say? One thing that I have learned, you know what I have learned? It's better for me to confess my sin because when I bring it into the light, then the devil has no hold over me. But when I want to keep quiet about it and I want to hide it and I don't want to confess it, even if it means I must confess it to somebody that I entrusted, I can confess it to. I bring it out into the light. You know, the minute I bring it out into the light, immediately there is a deliverance for me already. Because now it's no longer in the dark. It's now in the light. And now when the devil tries to get the better of me in that area, uh, uh, he can't because now I've already brought it into the light. He can't keep condemning me in that area now because I brought it into the light. He says, do not fear those who kill the body. Do not fear those who kill the body, but are unable to kill the being. So do you see, do not fear if they're going to kill your body, but are unable to kill the being, but rather Fear him. So you see, who are we to fear? Do you understand? We want to fear man. We want to fear what man thinks. We want to fear what man says. And we're trying to please man. And we're trying to please man and do what man is telling us to do. But the one that we should fear is to fear Yahuwah, who is able to destroy both being and body in Gehinnom. Because understand, the day is going to come that you're going to stand before him and he's going to say, my child, what did you do? Who did you listen to? Did you listen to me? into my leading and what I wanted you to do? Or did you go listen to that person that is speaking in your ear, that is being sent by the enemy to make you stumble so that you don't serve me? Who are you listening to? Are you sp listening to the voices of the people that are wanting to speak behind your back and you want to get all upset about it and now you want to go into all this place? What are you, who are you going to listen to? Are you worried about what they say about you? Are you worried about what I say about you? Well, let me tell you something. I'm getting to the place that I have decided. I'm more worried about what the Father says about me. I don't care what people says, say about me. I mean, just yesterday I was sitting there at the funeral with my friend. And I mean, understand, I'm surrounded by all... I mean, this was at the Catholic Church. So... I mean, you know, this is my husband's uncle. This is the Catholic Church. This is my family members. These are my friends. These are people that I've known for years and years and years. Well, friends, they're now more, I like, couldn't say they're friends, they're acquaintances. But I'm sitting with one that is a friend. And she says, you know, they will come up to me sometimes, Natalia. And they want to talk about you. And say, yeah, oh, you know, Natalia. She says, you know what, just keep quiet. That's my friend you're going to talk about. You know what? I'm not here to be able to carry on about what she does. Be, be careful what you say. And that is when I know that they speak behind my back because they don't like the things that I stand for. They don't like the way I dress. They don't like the things that I do. They don't like what's go. you know, they don't like what they see in my life. Now that the fact that I'm, you know, my husband is here and I'm there. They don't like none of this. They don't, they don't understand it. And they speak about me and they speak about my, my life and they speak behind my back and, and it's all this, this words. But you know what? Am I worried about these people and what they say? What am I more worried about? 
Am I worried about the fact that I am there to walk the path that the Father put before me and when it comes to the end of my life that I can walk in such a way to have to hear these words. My good and faithful servant, you have been faithful with little but much more shall be given to you. I live to be able to be to hear a kind of a word to say my good and faithful servant. So if I'm going to upset people here, if I'm going to do the things that I need to do on this earth, I'm always going to upset somebody here. Just me being who I am, I'm already upsetting people because of what I stand for. Therefore, is my father is pleased with me. And my father speaks loving words to me. And my father is the one who admonishes me. And my father is the one who lifts me up. And my father is the one who comes. And he's the one who's helping me. And he's the one constantly telling me how much he loves me. And he's the one constantly giving me words to tell me how he appreciates me. Then why am I worried about what people are going to say? Because who am I going to stand before on that day when everything is said and done? I am going to give an account before him. And I think if we were to live our lives having that in mind, I think we would live very differently. I think half the things that get to us wouldn't get to us anymore. Because our lives and the outlook of our lives and the view of what we have for our lives would be very different to what it is right now. So we are to live for the one. So don't worry about if they're going to kill you. They're going to kill you with their mouths. They're going to kill you with, they're going to, they're going to come a day that they're physically going to kill you. But already now they're killing you with their mouths. You know what? You just be faithful to do what the father's telling you to do. Whether they like it, whether they know they don't, whether they're going to kill you with their mouth or not, it doesn't matter. Just do what the Father's telling you to do. Are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin? And not one of them falls to the ground without your Father. And even the hairs on your head are all numbered. So do not fear. You are worth more than many sparrows. So understand, he holds you in the palm of his hand and you are precious to him. And he's the one who's bought you with a price. So because he bought you with a price, how much will he do for you if you put your trust and your faith in him and him alone? Remember, all of this is going to come to an end anyway. So what difference does it make? If you need to die for him, it means to live with him. So isn't that a blessing? The one who dies in him is going to live with him. So what a blessing is that? So why are we trying to do? Everyone therefore who shall confess me before men, him I shall also confess before my father who is in the heavens. You see, are you going to confess him? When the day comes, are you going to confess him? Are you going to stand for him? Are you prepared to die for him because you confessed him? Because you were a witness to him? You were a witness for him? then he's going to confess you before his father in heaven. But if you're going to start to deny him, which is what so many people are starting to do, especially in the messianic movement, they're starting to deny him. <laughs> then how is he going to confess you before the father? Because it's all about him at the end of the day. He's the one who came. He's the one who paid the price. Like someone trying to tell me, oh, he's a righteous man. He was he was a righteous man. I thought, what? <laughs> he wasn't a righteous man. He is right. He is righteousness. He is righteousness in the flesh. He became righteousness. He wasn't just a righteous man. But whoever shall deny me. Before men, him, I shall also deny before my father who is in the heavens. So you must understand, this is why we are spending time in this. And this is why the father is wanting me to be able to bring this message across. Imagine last week you heard me weeping where I was saying, Father, what do I speak from these two or three verses? What is there for me to say? And my goodness, how much does the Father have to say? 
where I still said to him last week, Father, if there's ever a time that I came to a place to say, today I want to say to the people, I'm sorry, I don't have a message for you. Sorry, sorry, today you must go and enjoy your Shabbat with the Father because I've got nothing to say. No, the Father's got a lot to say. So what is he saying to us right now? We better be understanding very carefully. We better start getting our priorities right. We better start understanding who are we a witness for. And that is why next week we're going to go into detail of witness. What is it that we've got to witness? Because now we are starting to understand that he's saying, whoever shall deny me before men, I shall also deny him before my father in heaven. So you see, you might have a gun put to your head. You might have a guillotine put to your throat. You might have all of this. You might have a gun at your grandchild's throat. You might have a gun at your son's or your daughter's head, whatever the case may be. And it's saying, deny him, deny him. Or I'm going to kill him. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? Or maybe you've got a hungry child. Or you've got a hungry baby. Or you've got a, a hungry a mother, a father. Whatever the case may be. Whoever it is. And now it's a case of life or death. You need to be able to now get food. Because if you don't get food. This, these people are going to die. Or maybe your child is going to die or whatever. And now you need to get food. But you know that in order for you to get this food. You're going to have to bow to a system. So what is the choice that you're going to make? Are you going to deny him for you to be able to save your child or your husband, your wife or whatever it is? Are you prepared to say, well, you know what? I cannot do this and if we have to perish, we perish and this is just the way it's going to be. Today, you have to understand that this is the reality that is going to confront us. And you see, we are not conditioned. We live in a get what we want society. Enjoy life, get what we want, do what we want. You know, it's a quick fix. It's a drive through McDonald's. I do a drive through with him. I want him, I give him my, my prayer request. He must answer it and spit it out on the other side. You know, put, put in my order. It must be spit out on the other side. And I want to enjoy it. And that's the way it is. Lo and behold, I don't want to bow my knee to anything. I don't want to give up my life for anything. I am the master of my own life and he's there to serve me. Well, you, I'm here to say to you today that those that are living like this right now are part of the great falling away that is going to happen and we are going to see masses and masses. And let me tell you, just yesterday, as I was talking to my cousin, who they still part of the, the church where they run the Alpha course that, that father had me start there 22 years ago. And he was telling me, well, COVID really came to do a lot of problems. I said, why you say that? Because we've just lost people. I said, what do you mean? He says, people don't want to come to church anymore. He says, and the people, the biggest dropout that we've had is amongst the youth. I said, yeah, well, there you go. You see, because if church was just a place that you went to to feel good, to appease your conscience... I'm telling you now, it's not going to work for you anymore. And that's when I said to him, I said, you see, the whole reason for them going to church was wrong because that's what religion was giving them. Religion is just giving them empty words that mean nothing at the end of the day when there isn't a religion, when there isn't a relationship, but only religion. So what did religion, what happened with COVID came to strip this religious system so that people could become serious with their creator so that they could bow their knee. And my cousin was looking at me. I said, and as for the youth, you see, dead religious works is going to give them nothing because technology gives them everything that they need. That is their new religion that they follow. Their, their phones and technology 
has become a new religion. He says, yeah, because now they don't even want to come to church. They want to do it online. They want to do church online. So that they can be in the comfort of their houses with their pajamas and their slippers. I said, yes, because you see, it's just a convenience for um, for us to understand that it just appeases the conscience because I need to keep up with the front of a religious system that I follow. Just to appease my conscience that I've done something. But I tell you now, that is not going to help you in the days ahead. In the days ahead, if you do not have a strong relationship with the one who gave his life for you, you will not give your life for him. And this is why we already see so many fall, so many people falling at the moment. And so he says, do not think. We continue to read because we're going to read until the end of well, until chapter 40. I mean, verse 40. Do not think. That I came to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace but a sword. So understand. This is our Messiah speaking. And our Messiah himself is saying. I didn't come to bring peace. I came to bring a sword. Because what is the sword? The sword is my word. And this is what we're going to focus on next week. We're going to focus on the word. Because you see. You're either going to love his word. And you're going to die for that word. And you're going to live for that word. Or else you are going to fall to the system. Because he came to bring a sword. And the sword is going to separate bone and marrow. It's going to separate the righteous from the wicked. It's going to separate the sheep from the wolves. Those that are wolves in sheep's clothes amongst the sheep. It's going to separate. Because you see, the word is going to be what people are going to live by. They are either going to walk out the word or they're going to fall by the wayside. That's what's coming. And so he says, for I have come to bring division. Here we go again. A man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies, listen carefully, a man's enemies are those of his own household. So there's major decisions that are going to be made ahead of time for us to understand that our own will turn against us. And I want to go a little bit further to say, you know, the one that you will call a brother in the faith will even be the one to turn against you when he no longer believes as you believe. The one who is a brother and a sister in the faith will be the one to turn against you when they no longer believe as you believe here clearly. Because this is going to start happening. Brother will turn against brother. Even one that you walked with that was like a mother to you in the faith. When you start to walk your path of set apartness, they will be the very ones in the end that will then turn against you. He who loves father and mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take up his stake and follow me is not worthy of me. And he who has found his life shall lose it. And he that has lost his life for my sake shall find it. He who receives you receives me. And he who receives me receives him who sent me. So tell me something. How do we want to be able to receive the Father without receiving Messiah Yahushua? And this is now all of a sudden what they want to get us to deny. Let's read it again. He who receives me and he who receives me receives him who, se who sent me. He who receives you receives me. And he who receives me receives him who sent me. So how do you have the father without the son? You cannot. Because they are one. But this is the things that's starting to come within our own midst. People are starting to deny the deity of Yahushua, making him just the son, a man. So praise Abba Yahuwah, he is showing us here a very, very powerful, powerful 
message. And so we must understand that he says, I'm going to read this, what does it mean to be slain? And then we will end in this because then next week we will go into detail of being slain for the word. So what does it mean to be slain? So he turns around and he says, and the beings of those having been slain for the word. So they were being slain. What does that word slain mean? It's the word G4969. And it's the word safaso. Safaso. And it's to, to put to death by violence. To slay. To slaughter. To slaughter. To butcher like an animal for a sacrifice. They will be sacrificed for Yahuwah. So this is what it means to be slain. And what are they going to be slain for? They're going to be slain for the word. And so, and they're going to be slain for a witness. So next week we are going to go into detail of understanding what does it mean to be slain for the word. Because if we do not understand what we're being slain for, how are we going to be slain? So next week, we are going to go into detail of being slain for the word and for the witness. Because how do you die for someone that you don't really know what you're dying for? It's easy to say. You see, we have this mindset of thinking that this religious, uh, this, this, because of religion, we think that this thing is easy. But let me tell you something. Ask anybody who really wants to walk a set-apart life how difficult it actually is. This path is a narrow path. It's a narrow path. And the Bible says in Matthew chapter 7 that few find it because it's the narrow path. And why is it the narrow path? Let's just read quickly because we just, yeah, so go a few pages back to um, Matthew chapter 7, verses 13, and it says, enter through the narrow gate. It's a narrow gate because the gate is wide and the way is broad. So the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who enter through it. Because the gate is narrow and the way is hard pressed. That's what we went through when we read Philipsis. It's a pressing, it's a pressure, it's oppression, it's affliction, it's tribulation, it's distress, it's anguish, it's persecution, it's trouble. It's hard pressed. It's Philipsis. Which leads to life. Holy of Holies. I am the way out of court. I am the I am the way. I am the truth, holy place. I am the life, holy of holies, to be able to dwell with him in the holy of holies, coming back to eating from the tree of life. So narrows the road that leads to life, to eat again from the tree of life in the holy of holies, being intimate, being one with the Father, and there are few who find it. So few are going to find it because it's a hard-pressed road. It is a, a path that you're going to have to lay down, that you're going to have to sacrifice, that you're going to have to say no to many things, and many things will cost you. Might cost you your, your job, might cost you your family, might cost you your life in the end, but this is not our destination. This is not our final destination. Our destination is to rule and reign with the king in the millennial reign. This is just a passing through. You are just passing through. This is your wilderness. This is your wilderness where you are being equipped, where you are being tested, where you are being tried to be able to get you to your promised land. This is not your promised land. Your promised land is coming when Messiah Yahushua will come and gather you from the four corners of the earth and bring you to your promised land where you will reign and rule with him. But we are in our wilderness experience being tested and tried like the Israelites in the wilderness to see how do we behave while we are going through our tests. May I bless you all.
I'm going to pray and then I will close off with the ironic blessing. Abba Yohuan, I just want to thank you for your word, my Father. I thank you for this day and I thank you for this word. And I thank you, Father, for the fact that Messiah Yahushua is our witness. He's the one who's gone before us. He's the one who's already been slain. He's the one who's already laid down his life. He's the one who's already paid the price. He's the one who's shown us the way that we are to go. And no servant is greater than his master. And therefore he already knows what it's like to have to go through it so that we will not be alone. We will not be left in the dark. We will not be left in the lurch. We will not be left alone because he will be there with us right until the time that we will take our last breath in our bodies. But to die with him is to live with him. And so, Abba Yahuwah, we do not fear. The only one that we fear is the one, we do not fear the one who will kill the body, but we fear the one who, when we have died, is able to send us to hell. Because that is the reality of what we really need to think about, is that he has the authority to send us to hell. So whatever people do to us, whatever people do, whatever they say, whatever goes on around us now, this is just a passing through. And we are being equipped. We are being equipped to be able to come to the place of when we finally are going to go to our final destination, our promised land, to reign and rule with our King. So I want to praise and I thank you, Father, for this time and strengthen us in our inner man, Father. Strengthen us in you. Strengthen us in the word. Reveal yourself to us. Open up the mind of our understanding so that we can go deeper with you in the revelations that you want to give us of your word and of who you are. I thank you, my Father, for everything that you are revealing to us in this time. I praise and I thank you for this in Yahshua's name. I want to pray the ironic blessing for everybody that has listened to this teaching so that you may go forth on this wonderful Shabbat with his blessing. Yevarechecha Yahuwa veishmarecha Yaher Yahuwa panavelecha Vichunecha Yesa Yahuwa panav ayelecha Vayasem lecha Shalom Yahuwa bless you and keep you he will make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. He will lift up his countenance upon you and give you shalom. May you go in his shalom for the remainder of the Shabbat and Shabbat Shalom.